Our first speaker today is Chris Scheid. Chris is the director and shareholder of Pro Advice based in Victor Harbour. Chris works with farming families, family corporates and small and medium sized enterprises in a range of roles from management consulting, client manager and as a trainer in the farm management courses. He assists farming businesses throughout southern Australia to discover and meet their business goals, adapt to industry change, understand the financial performance of their business and manage intergenerational succession. Chris's talk today is about the importance of business performance and the role of ag tech. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much to Persa for putting on the ag tech forums and the, and the program uh, that we've got today. We've got an exciting program. Um, I think um, when we think about the last few years and where we are in the commodity cycle, I, th I think we're in a very fortunate position with where we are at the moment. Um, a couple of good seasons, Good red meat prices, wool prices not too bad, they've picked up. There's still future demand, plenty of future demand I reckon for red meat. So we're in a really fortunate position with where we are at the moment. Um, but I still get a feel working with clients and working in the livestock enterprise planning project that we were fortunate to, to get to, um, to, to be involved with PERSA. I still get the, the feeling that we're accidentally designing profit into our business. So the profits that we've got now largely are as a result of good seasons and prices. But today I want to talk to you about how we might be able to deliberately design profits into our business. Because my fear is, my fear is with inflation about to rise and what's happening with oil prices, my fear is that perhaps commodity prices might come off a little bit. Perhaps input prices, well certainly input prices are rising. And what happens if yields drop? 10%, prices drop 10% and costs increase 10%. What will happen to profit then? So I think now's a good time to be thinking about designing a deliberate profit in your business rather than accidental profit. And that's what I want to discuss with you today. Um, here's my seven little topics today. So I want to talk about, um, first and foremost, two different business models of running your farm business. A profit optimization model versus a taxation minimization model. So neither's good or bad, there's, there's pros and cons for each and I'll present them. Uh, I want to talk about, we, we know about land values increasing, so is it possible in future for our return on assets, our profitability to continue to rise with rising land values? I want to discuss as well um, if we do need to improve profitability in our business, if we do need to design profit into the business, what are the th three key drivers what are the three levers that we need to know about to pull to, to improve profitability? I want to discuss, you know, in terms of improving profitability, do I get better and improve profit or do I get bigger? And I've got a little model there to help you ascertain whether getting better or getting bigger may be a, a future course of direction. And then, of course, when we've got profits and we've got a farm, there's an innumerable is that a word? There's an infinite number of things we can do to invest in our business. So, so how do we make some decisions about where we invest in our, in our business? And then I'll finish with some top 10 principles from clients that we're working with uh, that are doing well in terms of profitability. That's my journey today with you. Uh, first and foremost, I think we need to define what profit is and what profit isn't. So first and foremost, profit isn't more cash at the end of the financial year than the start of the financial year. So you think about how, we, how could we have got more cash? Well, very simply, we may have just sold down more grain than what we had at the start of the year, for example. 600 tonne of grain and we, and we, and we ended the inventory at, at the year with you know, 100 tonne of grain. So was increased cash as a result of selling down our inventory or was it due to our energy and activities? So, Profit is not more cash at the end of the financial year than the start of the financial year. But what profit is, is it's our income from our activity on farm. It's plus the changes in our inventory. Started with 600 tonne of grain, finished with 100 tonne of grain. So we've used up inventory, decrease in inventory. Or 3,000 news, and we finish with 3,500 news, increase in inventory. So that adds to our gross profit. So gross profit is income plus the changes in our inventory. We then take away direct costs. So our direct costs are our commission, freight, uh, input costs, etc. Our gross profit from our direct costs gives us our gross margin and we take away our overheads. 
So our overheads are our cash overheads, such as accountancy, such as professional fees, rates, occupancy costs. And we take away non-cash overheads. So these, this is the difference between cash accounting and real management accounting. In cash accounting, we wouldn't include these things, but in management accounting, we're including non-cash overheads, such as depreciation, so the, the value of the wear and tear on machinery, and we're also including owner's labour in, or imputed labour. Talk about that next slide. So our income plus our trading inventory changes throughout the year, minus our direct costs, minus our overheads, cash and non-cash, equals earnings before interest and tax, EBIT. That's our profit. And if we know the value of all our assets, the real value of all our assets, our real value of land, our real value of livestock and real value of machinery, our EBIT divided by the total assets gives us our return on assets. And interestingly, that, that EBIT is directly comparable with the dividend from BHP shares or Telstra shares. So now, if we're measuring profit in a business like that, we can look at the opportunity costs of investing in our business as well as outside of a business. And then after, after profit, we've got to pay the bank back some interest and we might have to pay back some tax if we've made a good profit to get a net farm profit. So that, that's, that's our definition of profit. It's the cash changes, income minus expenditure minus the inventory changes, including the non-cash overheads. Now that's a very theoretical way of looking at profit. How do we practically do it? How do we do it at ProAdvice? Well, as I mentioned, we've, we've just finished the 24th Livestock Enterprise Planning Workshop for 300 businesses across South Australia from Woodner to Mount Gambier. And each of those businesses, we, we looked at their profitability from their taxation financials. So that's the answer about how you can do it at home. You can do it from your taxation financials. And the things in red that I've highlighted there are the only things you need to change in your taxation financials to, to turn a good set of numbers, an audited set of numbers, because I know you'd never tell porky pies to the tax office, so they've got to be right. So if we change those three, those three things there in red from your taxation financials, we can turn them from tax financials to management financials, and we can actually work out, you can actually work out what your profit is. So just quickly, what are they? We take taxable income. Or we take taxable income from your taxation financials and trading trading account. You ever seen your trading account in your taxation financials? Your trading account is your births, your deaths, your rations, right? Opening and closing inventory value, right? So sales are real, purchases are real, the dollars. The opening inventory numbers of livestock is real, but the value is not. The closing inventory numbers is correct, because I know you count all the legs divided by four and you give that to your accountant and that's your closing numbers. Yes? But the value is not real, because the tax office allow you to use market values or average cost or different values for your, for your livestock. So in your trading account, in your, in your taxation financials, if I change the value of my sheep and my cattle to something like a real value, then my trading account gross profit is a reflection of what's really happening. I then, so my taxable income, change the value of livestock, gives me my gross profit. Your direct costs are your direct costs, listed in your profit and loss in your taxation financials, peel them off, direct costs, things that increase as the number of units increase, commission, freight, etc. Gross profit minus direct cost, there's your gross margin, minus your overheads. Now the conversation I have is cash overheads are listed in your, in your profit and loss, occupancy, professional fees, etc. Non-cash overheads. So instead of tax depreciation, instead of tax depreciation, we look at management depreciation. And in the Livestock Enterprise Planning Workshops, uh, we ask participants, what's the value of your machinery at the start of the year? a million dollars, and we depreciate it at 12.5%, which means about every eight years it's being turned over. So therefore the depreciation of a million dollars is about $125,000. So that's the depreciation that gets put in, rather than the taxation depreciation. <coughs> now imputed labour. What's imputed labour? Imputed or implied labour. I was thinking about this this morning, and, and I think it's, it's the ancient Phoenicians 
I think the ancient Phoenicians were before the Egyptians, I think. My ancient history isn't that good. But the ancient Phoenicians had 10 principles of profitability. And I remember one of them was save 10% of everything you produce. So they didn't have banks in the days, but what they did do was they had grain inventories. So 10% of the grain they stored, 10% of the grain they produced they actually stored. But the second principle to bring into here is to pay yourself first. So the ancient Phoenicians, even back pre-Egyptian times, were talking about paying ourselves first. Do you pay yourself first in your business? Or do you take out what's left, partnership drawings at the end of the year, or take a meagre draw? So the ancient Phoenicians back pre-Egyptian times were talking about paying themselves first. What about you? So all we're doing in this is we're recognising what your value is really worth to your business. And imputed or owner's labour, we talk about that. So we talk about that in terms of the first person being the manager and the doer at about $115,000 per full-time equivalent. Right? And the second person, not a manager, but more a doing about, doer, about $70,000. So a two full-time equivalent farm, right? a mum and a dad operation, so to speak, is $115,000 for mum, the manager, and $70,000 for dad, the doer. Because we know that mums do all the managing, don't we? Yeah. So, quick summary. I, tonight, I can look, tonight, I know you'd be really keen to do this. You can look at your taxation financials. You can look at your trading account, put a real value for sheep and cattle in there, project your trading account, and there's your trading account, gross profit. You can change the value. Think about the value of the machinery times about 12.5%. There's real depreciation. And then think about how many full-time equivalents work in my business, owners work in my business, and 115,000 the first and 70 for the second. Now, just before I move off that, what's a full-time equivalent? So the definition of a full-time equivalent is, is working at 40 hours a week, 48 weeks of the year. So how many people here work 40 hours a week, 48 weeks of the year? No one. Okay, so, so invariably, and this is the conversation we had in livestock enterprise planning work, in workshops. Invariably, you know, the, um, mum, the farm manager, is probably one and a half full-time equivalent, 60 hours, and dad is probably another full-time equivalent. So we're probably looking at, you know, one and a half full-time equivalents, 115 plus a half plus 70. And that's our owner's labour. That's what we take off. <coughs> now, coming back a step... Why are we doing this? Why are we working this out? Well, we're working this out because your taxation financials don't tell you the truth about your business. If you're running your business on the profit and loss that's, at the, that's, that's printed in your taxation financials, you might as well toss a coin to decide to invest or not invest in your business because you've got about a 50% chance that it's right or wrong. So all we're doing with this is we're turning your tax financials into management accounts, real figures, and we're removing the subsidies. We're removing the subsidies of accelerated depreciation and removing the subsidies of not paying yourself what you're worth. So that the profit that you project from your management financials is a real profit due to your management skills and abilities. That's why we do it. <coughs> right, so that's definition of profit, what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, profit optimization versus taxation minimization. Let's just discuss that quickly. Um, it's not a trick question here, but what are the outcomes if taxation minimization is the focus of your business? What are the outcomes? What do you get? Would anyone be courageous enough to speak? What do you get if you aim to minimize tax? What do you get? I reckon you minimize tax, correct. You get that. But if all your problems look like nails, then the only tool you've got is a hammer, isn't it? That's the only tool you use. So when you aim to minimise tax, what, what does your accountant do? So your accountants are very good, not, not, not dispersing accounts at all. There's an excellent role, and I'll, tell you, I'll talk to you about the role for accountants but in a minute. Um, but how do accountants minimise tax? Well, 
they use taxation rules such as instant asset write-off or accelerated depreciation, farm management deposits, etc., and use pre-provisioning for interest, etc., bring forward provisions. So they do tricky things or different things that they're allowed to do in the Tax Act to help minimise tax. And the outcome of that is that you minimise tax. <coughs> the outcome of minimising tax, to me, is I reckon that there is less or no profit. And I question whether there is choice in your business if there's not profit. You're not paying tax, but if you've got no profit, where do you invest on farm? It's only through borrowings. Where do you invest off farm? Perhaps you can't. How do I live better and go on a holiday or send the kids to school, good school? Y you can't. And how do I repay debt? You can only repay debt when you're paying tax. So while one is taxation minimisation and profit optimisation, one of the impacts to me of taxation minimisation as a focus of your business is that invariably there's less or no profit. And in my career started around 1990 and we saw a hell of a lot, that, a lot of that for about 10 years. We'd come out of the war crisis um, and there was a hell of a lot of taxation minimisation. Um, I think another thing is borrowing ability is limited where your taxation minimisation. I see there's a couple of bankers here today and my understanding of the Banking Royal Commission from about three years ago now is that in many cases where the bank manager sees a loss in your profit and loss in your taxation financials, they have to tick the box of loss. Where they see a profit, they tick the box of profit. So if they're ticking the box of loss, that's, that's going against you. Perhaps, and perhaps borrowing is threatened to some degree. And I think as well, um, IAWO instant asset write-off, I, I suspect there's a day of reckoning coming for us this year or certainly next year with instant asset write-off. So instant asset write-off is where the taxation department, the Federal Treasury, said at the, start of the, at the start of the global pandemic that we need to stimulate expenditure and investment in the business. So we'll give you an accelerated 100% write-off on, on, uh, on machinery that you purchase. Now, if, if you're on that scheme, then to stay on that scheme and continue to write off 100% of depreciation every year, you've got to keep investing in machinery. Now, many depreciation pools that I see are at zero. And so while there's no tax that they're paying this year because depreciation is so high, taxable profit to zero, what happens the next year when they can't continue to replace machinery and there is no depreciation on the profit and loss? Taxable incomes will increase. Profits will be there. Tax will be there that, that will need to be addressed. Now, the, the Federal Treasury... They are a smart group of people. And do you think they knew that? Absolutely they knew that. They knew that they would stimulate investment in the economy, headers and tractors, etc. It's, what, a year and a half to get ahead, to get ahead of now? They knew that that, that, that that would stimulate the economy. They knew that they would take less tax and take a hit, but they knew that there was a windfall coming after investment in instant asset write-offs were written off. So if one thing you need to do today... One thing you need to do today is to speak to your accountant about what depreciation pool and scheme you're in. Because if you're in the instant asset write-off, there's a day of reckoning coming, so start planning for that. And I was thinking this morning too that if you haven't put in your 21 taxation financials, which are due uh, middle, of, middle of May, there's an opportunity, there may be an opportunity to speak to your accountant about can I change the pool that I'm in, for example. And if I can change the pool I'm in, perhaps it's a little bit better for me to pay a little bit of tax this year, this financial year, rather than paying a whole lot of tax in future financial years. <coughs> so, that's taxation minimisation. What about profit optimisation? If, what are the outcomes if profit optimisation is your destination? Well, starting on the negatives, you're going to pay a bit of tax you will pay a bit of tax. And in tax planning with clients, we talk about an optimal rate of tax to pay at 15 to 25 cents in the dollar. Now the outcomes to me, or the outcomes that I've seen with paying with, with that sort of level of tax rate is that there is surplus cash left over. So I was only looking at a client's figures yesterday. Uh, they've got a $2 million turnover 
um, we just just finished their tax. I've got an annual general meeting with them in two weeks' time, and they're paying 26 half cent, 26 and a half cents in the dollar tax. That's a lot. But the previous, in the last financial year that we purchased four million dollars worth of land, we made four contributions of twenty-five thousand dollars into superannuation to help minimise tax for the family. So we did a whole lot of different things, and there's still cash for that business left over at the end of the financial year for them to do things. A holiday, pay off debt, etc., and they are paying off debt. So while focusing on profit, while focusing on profit means you'll be paying tax, invariably there's cash left over at the end of the year. And I think with cash, you've now got choices. And the choices you've got are that you can invest on farm, you can invest off farm, you can repay debt, or you can live a bit better. You can do the kitchen for mum, you can have a beach house, you can send the kids to you know, the school that you wish. And that's what I'm about when I'm working with clients, how to optimise profit in their business. And then I bring the accountant in and I deliver the result, the expected result to the account and I say, now minimise tax. And I'll talk to you about machinery investing in a, in a slide or two's time. So when I'm working with clients, we optimise profit first, and then we minimise tax second, so that we may get optimal tax rates about that, 15 to 25 cents in the dollar. Okay, quick summary. Profit optimization model versus taxation minimization model. Well, yes, in profit optimization, I'll have to pay some more tax. There will be more cash left over. I'll have a profit at the end of the financial year. But it's, perhaps it's easier to pay back interest. I've got choices and lots of them. And perhaps the bank can see me servicing debt and says, would you like some more money for future investment? Versus taxation minimization. Maybe there's no or less tax to pay. Maybe there's less or no cash available at the end of the financial year. No profit. Perhaps it's a bit harder to repay interest. There are less or no choices for the business owner. And perhaps the bank is asking, can you repay the loan? And just a personal opinion. To me, um, cutting my teeth in the advisory space in the 90s, there was a, there was a whole dearth of this. And I just wonder whether our kids, perhaps not returning to succession, not returning to, to the farm, etc., are as a result of you know, five or ten years of us not paying tax, not having choices, and our kids not seeing that. Let's not let that happen again. Let's let our profit improve and let's let our profits, let our kids see our profits, see and joining our business so that they want to come back to the, to the farm with us. Okay, land value is increasing. Is it, still, is it still possible to improve profitability with land, land prices increasing? Um, just to go backwards to answer this question, so down the bottom here, 1990 to 1991, 1999, there's 10 years there in that block. There's 10 years in this block and there's 10 years in this block. There's 30 years of return on assets for different industries in South Australia. We're looking at the return on capital excluding land values appreciating in price. So it's return on assets. The green are wheat producers for the 10 years, 90 to 91. The red are mixed livestock producers. The yellow are sheep producers, beef producers, and finally sheep beef producers. So that number there is 3.7. Clearly that's zero. So in that 1990 to 99 period, wheat producers were doing well. 1990, I know, the reserve price was pulled out in 1989. We had 160 million bales of wool and 160 million sheep. And in 1991, we were shooting sheep for a dollar. The wool crisis continued through to the next decade, and we probably cleared, we probably cleared 160 million bales of wool sort of 12 years later. What's the point I'm trying to make? Just have a look at the trends. So probably here, Probably here in this band, um, land values, maybe 250, 300 bucks a DSE in a grazing. In this block here, 2000 to 2009, I know I was assisting clients buy land at 350 bucks a DSE. 
in 2010 to 2019. At the tail end of that, we, we were looking at $800 to $1,000 of ESC to buy grazing land, cropping land, of course, similar. So while land prices have been increasing over that time, and while we're only looking at average returns for different industries in South Australia, on general, you could say that average return on assets have increased while land values have increased. Now, they're not at 5%. But, they, but there's a general trend of increasing there. So I, I'm confident, um, I'm confident with businesses that are designed well for profitability, there's businesses that are designed to, to look at profit optimization, businesses that harvest good prices, good seasons, keep costs low, right, that there will be, that there will be good profits into the future. Right. Um, if, if we are to design profit deliberately into our business rather than accidentally. Let, let's look at some key principles about how we do that. So let's have a bit of a deep dive into profitability principles. Now I know many have seen this, so I'll quickly go through this slide, but to me it's a seminal piece of um, teaching in terms of where profit, the functions of profitability come from. So this is your Bachelor of Agriculture, or this is your Bachelor of Economics degree in, in 10 minutes. So if we Design a business, if we design a business, we track the dollars along this axis and we track the number of units, be it number of sheep or cows or area we crop along the bottom. If we design our business from the start, we need people, we need machinery, right? We've got a whole lot of overheads to, to run our business. Uh, we drench sheep, we sow a crop, we sell cattle, we've got direct costs, and our overhead costs plus our direct costs gives us our total costs. We sell some sheep, we sell some cattle, we sell some crop, and we've got income. And at that point there, called break even, everything above that line is profit. So our income is greater than our costs, so we're in profit. And at this point here, our costs are greater than our income, so we're at loss. Okay, so, so far you've, you've completed the first semester of your agriculture degree. So let's, let's get to your bachelor's degree now in, in, in economics. So if, you, if we're here at break even, if we're here at break even, what can we do to improve profitability? Okay, we could, can we do something with, can we, can we do something with costs, with direct costs? Could we increase direct costs and increase production or price? Could we put fertilizer on, more fertilizer and get a response? Could we do something like grain marketing? A client I work with, we spend a dollar a ton a year on grain marketing and last year we made three dollars a ton. Three dollars per ton from grain marketing minus one dollar of cost is a two dollar margin divided by three dollars of the income is a 66% gross margin ratio. Spend a dollar of direct cost to make three dollars of income, there's your gross margin ratio. So we could increase direct costs, increase production, or get a better price, right? and we'd increase profit. Would you agree with me there? So that's yes, that's yes, and that's no. Okay. So let's try it, everyone. Would you agree with me? Yes. Right, thanks, thank you. Okay, so that's one thing we could do. We could increase direct costs. That would change our income. Where We'd increase our gross margin. Could we reduce direct costs and improve our margins? Yes, we could. We could, as long as we didn't affect production or price. Okay, so the first one we're talking about is improving gross margins. But the second cost there is overheads. Right, can we reduce overheads? Right, what are overheads? Overheads typically are people and machinery. Right? They're hard to, it's hard to manage and deal with people. It's hard to run a business with less, with less machinery, hard to manage a business with less people, right? but it can be done. Often when I come to businesses and look at succession planning and I've got three generations around the table, I'm thinking overhead ratio here. So succession planning can be assistance in terms of, of, in terms of reducing overheads. Overheads are, can be reduced, but they're very difficult to do so. So first thing we can do is we can improve our gross margin. We could lower our overhead costs. 
And the third thing we could do is we could increase our turnover. So if this was 3,000 ewes, if this was 3,000 lambs produced, if we could um, produce more lambs, better lamb survival, better lambing percentage, well then our turnover would be here and we would be in profit. Now, there are only three things you can do to improve profitability in your business. Reducing overheads, improving gross margins, or increasing turnover. And that's the same for your business, for my business, for a bank's business, for the football club here. So the question is, which is it for you? Do you need to increase turnover? Do you need to address overheads? Or do you need to look at the margins of your enterprises? And in the livestock enterprise planning workshops, my assessment would be of those 300 businesses would be about seven and a half out of 10 need to address, for those that are lacking profitability, some were very profitable, but for those lacking profitability, about seven and a half out of 10 need to address turnover, about two out of 10 need to look at their overheads, and one out of uh, half, I think it is, half out of 10 need to look at gross margins. So by far and away, turnover, improving turnover is the predominant vehicle for improving profitability. Okay, only three secrets of improving profitability. There's the, there's the key ratios. So turnover ratio is our gross profit as a, as a proportion of our total assets. We want $15 of gross profit for, our, for every $100 of assets. Of our gross profit, we want to retain 35% or we want, we want to spend 35%, retain 65% of our gross margin. And we want to spend no more than 35% of our gross profit in overheads. If we have those ratios, then we have an operating profit of 30%. There's our return on assets, EBIT over total assets. There's our return on equity. Lease businesses, if our return on assets manage is greater than our return on assets, if our profit on our own business plus our lease business is greater than just the profit on our own business, then we're using lease funds well to grow our business. And for debt funded businesses, if our return on equity, if our return on equity is greater than our return on assets, if the return on our equity, what we own, is greater than the return on the whole business, then we're using debt funded, debt funding to, to grow our business. Okay, how do we fix overheads? We need to look at people and machinery invariably. People talk to me about succession planning. Uh, I was on the West Coast a couple of weeks ago with a final livestock enterprise planning workshop and there was a business there that had $3 million worth of machinery, $1 million worth of income. A three to one machinery to income when one to one is, is, is pretty good. So there's, there's some things to think about there for that producer in terms of perhaps contracting, using existing labour to sort of expand their business and, and utilise machinery a bit. So other things we can think about are substituting machinery ownership for contracting, succession planning, as I've said. For turnover, turnover is about production and price. So anything that increases production or increases price improves your turnover. Um, so at the moment, at the moment, wheat prices are pretty good for this harvest coming up in December 22. They've taken a little bit of a kick. Um, so maybe there are opportunities to look at securing wheat prices for next year, securing price. And for our gross margins, for gross margins, we're looking at anything we do to increase turnover or reducing direct costs or the combination of both will assist with the gross margin ratio. And often, often if I see businesses that have lots of enterprises and looking at diversifying, they can be businesses that have gross margin issues. Okay, a quick dive, one slide into banking ratios and then bring it all together. So banks, Banks are, looking for, banks are asking three questions. First question, can you service the debt? If you can't, what sort of security? And thirdly, if you can service the debt and if you've got security covered, then do you want some more money? So a couple of key debt servicing ratios, finance costs, so interest and lease is a percentage of your gross profit. Benchmark, interest coverage, how much EBIT, or sometimes the banks use EBITDA, depreciation, amortization as a percentage of, of interest and borrowing costs, so more than two times as a benchmark. Trend is the friend there. Or a three to one, or less than three to one debt to income ratio. So those three types of ratios talk to the bank about the ability of your business to service debt. And of course, if you can't service debt, then banks need to ensure that they have security to get their money back. 
So some banks look at 50% loan to value ratio and other banks 70%. And the final thing, if, if banks have got, if you've got debt serviceability covered and if you've got security covered well, well then often the banks, their visit to you is, would you like some more money? Because you must have a debt serviceability business, you must have a profitable business. <coughs> Tie it together. Let's bring profitability and financeability together. And when we get it right, this is what we get. If our turnover ratio is at 15%, is at benchmark levels, represented by a $100 bill, and if our direct costs are less than 35% of gross profit, then our gross margins are at 65%, $65 divided by 100. And if our overheads are at less than 35% of our, of our gross profit, then our EBIT, 65 minus 35, is $30. And then servicing debt, if they are at sort of benchmark levels of $15 per hundred, well then our net operating profit is $15. So that's a business designed well. Overheads, turnover, gross margin, finance. That's a business down there that's got $15 and $100 that it earns to pay tax first, to invest off farm, to invest on farm, to pay yourselves better or to repay debt. What happens when things aren't designed well? So let's represent the same $100 as saying turnovers there, but if direct costs are 10% more than where they should be, our gross margins are 10% less where they should be. And if our overheads are 15% more than where they should be, so they're 50% of income rather than 35% of income, then we've only got $5 of EBIT per $100 of cash coming in. We've still got the same finance costs, finance or lease costs, and we've got a net operating profit that's negative of minus 10. So what looks like a lack of profit, and perhaps, um, unfortunately, sometimes the banks get blamed in terms of we've, we've, we've got too much borrowings and our interest rate's too high, is actually not the problem. The problem is in red there. It's the design of your business. The design of the business there has caused a lack of profitability. So this is where we, we need to look at our responsibility. Rightio. So we've, decided, we've had an introduction to whether I should minimise tax and whether I should optimise profit. And just on that, um, yes, look at optimising profit. And then, yes, use your accountant to minimise your tax. I'm not saying to pay lots of tax. I'm saying to use your account in the right order. Optimise your profit first. Minimise your tax second. We've looked at land values and is there potential for land values and profits to improve with land values increasing? Um, the three secrets of design for our business are overheads, turnover, gross margin, and you need to know which one, which of those levers to pull. Do I get better or do I get bigger? So if I'm looking to improve profitability, do I get better with my own management or do I get bigger and go and lease and buy land? Here's a little, uh, little framework matrix that might help you with that thinking. Now this comes from Dennis Wignall who helped me um, put together a whole lot of ABARES figures. Uh, and, and Dennis is an excellent analyst and he's pulled together for me here mixed cropping and livestock farms. What's that for? For 30 years. 1991 to 2020. So 30 years of mixed cropping and livestock farm. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at across the top here we're looking at quartiles of management. So the top 25%, the top quarter of management in terms of return on assets is in that column. The next 25% is in that column and the bottom 25% is in that column. And across this side here, I've got scale of business. So down the bottom, I've got small businesses, less than $200,000 turnover, 200 to half a million dollars of turnover, half a million to a million and a million dollars of turnover. And in the body, of this is return on assets, excluding land values appreciating. So it's return on assets profit. And what I can see here with quartile one businesses, quartile one businesses that have more than a million dollars of turnover are averaging for the 30 years about 10.9% return on assets. And I can see quartile two businesses that are half a million to a million dollars in turnover are averaging about 3.5% return on assets. Like the bottom 50% at 200 to 500 are doing minus 0.3%, so they're not even breaking anything. 
and, and, and the bottom 25%, small businesses, are doing minus 8%. I can also see, just to scale you in, that regardless of management, regardless of management, businesses that turn over more than a million dollars are averaging 4.2%, regardless of management. Regardless of management, businesses half a million to a million at 2.4%. Regardless of scale, the top 25% producers are averaging 5.1% and the next 25% 2.4%. And the whole, the whole shoot and match for 30 years, regardless of management and regardless of scale, are averaging 1.3%. And probably inflation was more than that for that 30-year time period. So that's just to set, settle you in on that. So we're looking at management ability here and scale of business. So the first thing to note is that when I improve my management, when I go from quartile four to quartile three to two to one, down the bottom here, minus two to 0.7 to 2.4 to 5.1, I'm jumping up in return on assets by about two to two and a half percent. So when my management gets better and I move to a different quartile, my profit's increasing, that makes sense. Second point, when I increase my scale, and I go from, from here to here to here to here, when I jump my scale, that it's also increasing profit by two to two and a half percent. Which one's easier to do? Get better or get bigger? So that's not a good question to ask. Which one's less risky to do? Getting better, improving yourself, timing your management, etc. Or is it less risky to get bigger by leasing and buying? Right? It's probably easier to get better, isn't it? So point number one. Point number two is that there's a minimum scale, there's a minimum scale of business to be profitable. Now it's two to it's two less than two hundred thousand there at minus point eight, minus four point four, minus two, minus, none of them are profitable at any level. So small businesses it's, it's very hard to be profitable, and even at 200 to 500,000 a turnover, you've got to be in the top 25% to have some sort of chance of being profitable. So, so what do we do with those businesses? What can we talk about with those businesses that, that perhaps don't have scale on their side? Well, to me, a business that's you know, 200 to 250 or even 300,000 a turnover is, is a half a business. In, in my experience, I reckon... Dennis has got 500,000 of turnover as a break even to, be, to look at profitability. Look at your 500 ones, right? You can be average at 50% and there's a 3.5% return there that's possible just because you've got scale. But if you're smaller, then you've got to be top 25%. So to me, with smaller businesses, it's about what they do. So, so rather than it being a six-day-a-week business, maybe it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday business for their 300,000 of turnover, which is equivalent to a six day a week full time full time business. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for three hundred thousand dollars a turnover and let's do something else or think about doing something else on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Maybe it's off farm work. There's plenty of off farm work there um, that, that, that's available. So that, that's the conversation with smaller businesses. Well they can still be profitable, they've just got to scale back their time and design appropriately. Next point. <coughs> Producers at or above the 500,000 of turnover can, be, can aspire to be profitable, can aspire to be at the 4% return on assets. And the question is, should you get better or should you get bigger? Well, if you know, if you know what the scale of your business is, and if you know your return on assets, then you can work out whether you're a quarter one, two, three, or four manager. So you can work out where you are. So if you're over here at 3.5%, perhaps you could improve yourself and get, get better and aspire to be 6%. If you're over here, then perhaps I've got to get better. But if I'm over here, then perhaps getting bigger is a direction of travel for me. So I just include that so that if you know the scale of your business and you know your profitability, it gives you an idea about whether getting better or getting bigger could be a direction of travel. But as you've picked up, the, the less risky thing to do is to get better and to continually get better. Okay, now, now we've made some, we've designed our business to be profitable. Uh, we've got some profits. We're minimising tax with our accountant. Let's have a quick conversation here about investment decision making. 
So where do we spend scarce capital? Um, I don't have enough time to talk about where you spend scarce capital on a farm. There's lots of places. But to me, again, where there's profit, you've got choice. Where there's not profit, it's probably coming out of borrowings. So the investment decisions there are even more important. So I, I think there's four choices around tax planning time and setting your budget to look at in terms of investing. So I, I think you can invest off-farm, number one, uh, for succession, for the, for the generation one, for the non-farming children, and maybe there's beach house, maybe there's diversification of assets. So my example is the client I was looking at yesterday. So uh, $2 million turnover, 26 half cents in the dollar. We made four contributions of superannuation, $25,000 each. Son 27 and son 23 have already got a superannuation balance of $200,000 because of profitable businesses. Right? So that's helping them. That's helping them with their future living. And mum and dad, of course, as well, they've made contributions over decades. So that's helping them with their succession and retirement. The superannuation fund itself is a pot of wealth for non-farming children. And there's been still surplus cash after they've contributed to superannuation, after they've paid tax, to contribute to a, to a house in town to continue to diversify their asset base. So that's what's happened as a result of profit and that's what's happened as a re deliberate result of designing profit in their business, minimising tax second. I think this, there's the first choice. I think the second choice, the second choice we have is to invest on farm. I'll discern it down to three areas that we can invest on farm. The first one is investing in areas that increase production and, and productivity. So there's shearing sheds that we'll hear about from Emily today. There's ag tech and data that we're going to hear about from Nathan. Right? And there's uh, um, equipment and, 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 self and sheep handlers that we're going to hear from Ben today. They're all decisions that we can do, that we can do to improve labour efficiency and productivity. So very often, there's one client that I'll visit in a couple of weeks' time and they're very disciplined. They have an A and a B list of capital, right? And they look at their A list and we sit down with their A list and we look at return on capital. So the $30,000 that we're going to put towards something, we look at the return on capital for a sheep handler versus this, versus that, versus that. So they make decisions based on where they're going to get their best return for their investment. That's, so that's one way. Another way, perhaps I worked with a corporate client whereby retaining staff was really important, so facilities. So they invested in facilities to maintain and retain staff. And the other area that we can look at in investing is improving labour efficiency. So if we're not quite at our 600,000 of turnover per full-time equivalent and our labour unit say at 500 or 550,000 per full-time equivalent, then labour efficiency devices might help us get to that 600,000 per full-time equivalent turnover. <coughs> Thirdly, I think we can invest. We can we can choose to invest in ourselves, children's education, beach house, farmhouse, or, or, or the kitchen, for example. So that's a third choice, and a fourth choice is that we can repay debt. You can't repay debt unless you're paying tax. And to me, repaying debt is about the future farm asset purchase. If I can leverage my borrowings at seventy percent with my bank. The 100000 I repay in debt is effectively a $70,000 purchase of land in the future to come, if I can draw that back. And to me, talking about inflation and perhaps costs rising and perhaps incomes dropping off with prices perhaps, perhaps there's, a, there's an argument for a little bit of debt repayment and business resilience because it's what you do in the good years that determines how you survive the bad years. Last couple of slides, just some top 10% principles. Um, <coughs> so here's some examples of clients that are in our top 10% and what they're doing. So first and foremost, they haven't just got there by magic. They haven't woken up the next day and they all of a sudden become a top 10% top 10 client. They've worked hard at it over the time, but they've looked at structure of their business. They've also had assistance. So they've had assistance to get their business structure right. Um, they've got their overheads designed so they're fully utilised. $600,000 of turnover per full-time equivalent. If you're a two full-time equivalent business, 
right? It's $1.2 million of turnover. If that's where you are, you've got labour utilised at their right ratios. If you're at a million dollars and you need to get to $1.2 million for two FTEs, then that's where leasing comes into the conversation or other opportunities there. And where we add that extra $200,000 from leasing, for example, and we're not adding overhead such as machinery, we're just utilising existing machinery, utilising existing, existing labour, now we're fully utilising our labour. Um, to me, specialisation focuses energy and reduces overheads and keeps it simple. Um, my very quick and dirty uh, business success, the three key principles are do what you like doing, do what's suited to your country, so breeding sheep, breeding country, cattle on cattle country, cropping on cropping country, don't try to do something different. Do what you like doing, do what's suited to your country and do lots of it, specialise in it. Specialisation means you've got to be profitable because if you're not, if you're not, you're out of business. You need to have a base scale of turnover to be in the top 10%, so 600k per full-time equivalent. Right? If you're under half a million dollars turnover in your business, it's pretty hard to be profitable, so think about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday business and what you can do Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Improving gross margin ratio through efficient conversion of direct costs. So think about, look at your, look at your rotations that you've just set up. Look at, of course, you've got fertiliser and you've got chemical costs. You've got Roundup at 16 bucks a litre. So look, look at your direct costs and are you spending a dollar of direct costs for three dollars of income? Right? And, and, and to me, this is where agronomists can come in. So agronomists, agronomists are about improving, are about making the most for you. But sometimes like, you could be spending $2 to make $3, and that's inefficient. So ask your agronomist, to, are you spending a dollar of direct cost to make $3 of income? Because if your agronomist is that level there, you've got your gross margins right. Leasing only works if it improves utilisation of overhead. So that million dollar business to get to 1.2, that we're not adding machinery and we're not adding labour. Uh, level of borrowings is important. Not too much, not too little. Uh, the top 10% have good systems and management, so they've already identified risks and they've got policies in place to mitigate or to stop risk or to, to manage risks when it occurs. So therefore, they're responsive with their management. Uh, I mentioned matching enterprise to environment, and once you're in the top 10%, getting bigger and replicating. So my $1.2 million business design well here, if, if your business model is to grow again, well then let's go and look at another $1.2 million land business and grow again. Let's replicate and duplicate. So therefore, once you're in the top 10% turnover drives profitability. Um, I've mentioned that one, last couple of takeaways. Um, a unit of efficiency of labour is 600000 per full-time equivalent. I've mentioned the machinery value ratio. Uh, the last thing I'll finish on is uh, I fo while I focused a lot, on, a lot on tax and a lot on business design and a lot on the money side, in my experience as well, where families are functioning well, business profitability follows, and where people are functioning well, then profit also follows. And the corollary, the opposite, is also true. Thanks very much, Jody.